would go ahead and mark at this time number 907. Number 907, Hark the Gentle Voice. That'll be our song of invitation. Once you get that marked, turn to number 409. Number 409. says, in memory of Horace Bratcher, thank you, in memory of Horace Bratcher, thanks to God, 10,000 angels, and to all of our friends in the whole world. Thank you for the prayers, visits, cards, phone calls, flowers, food, and a million other things. I'm doing very good. I'm sorry that I'm late, but I have a hard time seeing and writing. Now let's all keep calm and carry on. Thank you. In Christian love, FLT, Friendship, Love, and Truth, Doris Bratcher and family. She's a sweetheart. How many of you are like I am? When you go to a restaurant, do you practically insist upon a seat that allows you to see the door? Or are you comfortable with your back to the door? I'm not comfortable with my back to the door. In the military, we refer to this as situational awareness. Now, we can be in here in this comfortable auditorium, and, and I can let my guard down. Why? Because there are watchmen patrolling these hallways, maintaining vigilance. They are aware, and they are there so we can worship in peace. Anywhere you go where there are people congregated, city streets, airports, the mall, you can count, generally count on one hand if you look for individuals that seem to be practicing situational awareness, you can generally count them on one hand. Have you seen the video of the woman walking down the street? It's a big city, probably New York or someplace like that, and she's doing this, looking at her phone, and she falls into a manhole. 
That's not, that is the opposite of situational awareness. Now, we're going to talk about Christian situational awareness. And to get a picture of what Christian situ situational awareness looks like, let's turn to the uh, letter to the, to the church in Philippi, Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. We're, what we're talking about now, Christian situational awareness, is having an outward perspective, not an inward perspective. I would venture to say the vast majority of you in this audience don't get up in the morning saying, it's all about me today. What can I do for me today? Because that's not, that's not walking in the footsteps of Jesus, something that we aspire to do. So in Philippians chapter 2, we read, If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort in His love, any fellowship with the Spirit, any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and in purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Each of you should not look only to your own interest, inward perspective, but also to the interest of others, an outward perspective. This was made manifest to me day before yesterday. Real example. Some of you may not know that my vocation is a letter carrier for the United States Postal Service. I've been one for 22 years now. Now, my avocation is a chaplain in the guard. That's my calling. But my, my job is being a mailman. I walk about six miles, and I drive about the same number of miles, and I'm in my vehicle tooling down the street to my next delivery point, and it's a cluster box. It's a box that has about five different addresses in it, boxes, individual boxes, where individuals in that particular block go to get their mail. So I, the object is to drive up there right in front of the box. I don't even have to get out, take my key, open it, and put the mail in and drive on. Side note, if you want to endear yourself to your letter carrier, don't block your mailbox. If, you're, if your mailbox, if you have a curbside mailbox and it's on this side of the driveway, put your trash cans on this side of the driveway. See how that works? That way, more than likely, when the sanitation collectors do their job and they have an empty trash can, they're not going to leave it right there in front of your mailbox. Well, that particular day, three trash cans in front of this cluster box. So I was preparing myself. I make over 700 stops every day, and, uh, and so time is of the essence. And, and we're told if we get out of our vehicle, we have to turn the motor off, put it in park, tur curb the wheel, uh, you know, and it, these things take time because we're on the go. Well. I see coming down the street the opposite direction, and we're talking about an outward perspective, okay? I see coming down the street from the opposite direction Ms. Washington. Ms. Washington is an encourager, Steve. She's tooling down the street in her motorized wheelchair. She's a double, double amputee. She doesn't have her legs or her feet from the just below the knee down but every day she has a word of encouragement for me she sees me coming and from her wheelchair she's moving trash cans god love her bless her heart from her wheelchair get a picture of this from a, her wheelchair this elderly woman is moving trash cans it's not her house. She lives about three blocks in the opposite direction. She's doing it for me. And I, I drive up there, and I look at her, and she has a smile on her face, and she's wearing a cap. The day before yesterday, it was a little cool, and she had a cap, and on the brim of her cap, it said, I heart Jesus. And I said, yes, you do. 
Bless your heart. Yes, you do. You look like somebody that loves Jesus. You act like somebody that loves Jesus. God love you. I told her today, I saw her today, and I said, I'm going to bear witness to what you did for me yesterday. She didn't want me to, but she gave me permission to nonetheless because I told her how much it blessed me and that I wanted to bless others by telling, her the telling you the story. That's what it looks like to have an outward perspective. That's what it looks like to be following the footsteps of Jesus Christ. The takeaway, don't get up in the morning and look in the mirror and say, it's all about me. Let's be like Jesus. Let's have an outward perspective. If you have not given your life to Jesus Christ, if you have not been buried in the waters of baptism and washed in the precious blood of Jesus Christ, I cannot say it better than Ananias said to Saul, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized and wash your sins away, calling on his name. Whatever your need, come now as we stand and sing. Father and God in heaven, we're so grateful to you for blessing us and for taking care of us, for providing all that we need on this earth. Father, we, we, we worship you and we, we, we help us, Father, each day to, to think about you and to think about the things like John has said tonight, that to live a life that reflects Jesus in our lives and, and to reach out and, and help people and to show, show the love of Christ through our love for others. Father, we thank you for this congregation of people that meet here. We pray your blessings on them. We have so many, Father, that are sick and, and that, that have gone, that have lost loved ones. We pray you'll be with them. We pray you'll heal the sick. We pray you'll bring peace to them and to their families. And Father, be with comfort and be with the ones that have lost loved ones. Father, we, we thank you for our eldership here, Father, and we pray for them. We have so many good men who serve as elders here and and we pray for the unity of the congregation, and we pray that you'll continue to be with them and strengthen them. We especially want to, want to mention Robin Haynes, Father, and we pray you'll, you will be, be with him and, and bring him peace. Father, go with us now as we, as we go to our classes. Be with us and forgive us when we sin. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Test, test. All right, thank you. Let's see here. Here you go, Tom. That's from last week. Anybody not have the lesson from last week? It would be lesson number four. All right. Can I get some help here? You want to help me, brother? Thank you. Lesson number three. I don't know. I'll make up something. All right. I have this many of lesson three left, and that's it. All right. Thank you. All right. Pass, pass some of those back, if you will. Thank you. Thank you. All right, if you need lesson four, raise your hand. If you need lesson three, raise your hand. Oh, my. Okay. The one that's not numbered on the top is lesson four. He's got four. Three. They need some right here. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We need to hustle on. We're going to uh, not make much dent in this tonight in the time we've got, but we're going to do the best we can. I want us to do a quick review. Uh, I know we've moved kind of quickly in here. So I want to uh, look at some things, particularly with lesson number three, that deal with the uh, attributes of angels. And uh, lesson number three right here. Lesson number three right here. Number four doesn't have a number on the top, but lesson three does. All right. Good, good. Thank you for your interest. We've talked about the origin of angels, and we talked about how the form of angels comes in different uh, forms as we see them in the Bible. And then we talked about how angels do not marry, um, that they are what are we call sexless, that they have no gender. Uh, they are referred to in the Bible uh, as times we have seen their names. They are referred to and in the masculine uh, given names such as Michael and so when you think of that you hear uh, a masculine type name and um, that they are uh, personal agents of God doing his bidding the word angel means messenger we've said that almost every week we've been in here and they have super intelligence they are angels um, full of intelligence they said in 2nd Samuel chapter 14 and verse 20 says, and my Lord is wise according to the wisdom of an angel of God. And so angels are given a great measure of wisdom, even superhuman, if you'll allow me to use that word, even though they're not human. And then they have a power to do great things. Uh, in Psalm 103 in verse 20, bless the Lord, you his angels, mighty in strength who perform his word, obeying the voice of his word. So they do the bidding of God, whatever he would have them to choose to do and whatever they would need to do, uh, they are uh, summoned by God to do those things. How many angels are they? Well, there are all the angels that have ever been created have been created, and they are innumerable. So let's talk for just a moment right there. And this is, might be where you want to throw out something and... Uh, well, this is, uh, it's on the back page of lesson three. Second page of lesson three, just a quick review. Just a quick review of lesson number three, second page. So occasionally I will hear someone, and I, I believe with all my heart, they are saying it the very kindest way they can, the most meaning that they can give forth. But folks, when someone that's close to us dies, they don't turn to angels. They don't turn to angels. We say sometimes that she was a great spirit. She was a great saint. He was a wonderful Christian man. Now, the humanity in us, when it comes down to the fact of a baby dying, we want to say automatically that, well, he was angelic. She was angelic. And God gained another angel today. 
I may be speaking to somebody in here that has lost a child, maybe a newborn, maybe a, a few weeks or a year. And so, you're, 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 Steve, you're, you're, you're dancing on my toes tonight. It's what you're thinking. But I just want you to understand that a, a baby that dies is a human, right? A baby that is aborted is a human. And so when a child dies, that child goes to heaven. Why? What would be the reason a child would go to heaven if it's an infant? Because they're innocent. What else? Sinless. Doesn't have to go through judgment. Do not go to jail. Do not collect $200. Go straight to heaven, okay? They're, they're pure in God's eyes. They have no sin. But it's a misnomer for us to think in our mind. In fact, it's more comforting to me to know that babies go right to be with God. Why would we want to transition them to be an angel? See? What was it, brother? Well, we have been taught that a lot. We've been taught that. And we talk about them just having a little angelic face and so forth. I've seen some little ones that weren't too angelic, haven't you? Yes, shake your head yes. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, they can tear up a crowbar in a sawdust pile. That's what my dad used to say, you know. But, but we know that little babies are innocent. They go right to heaven. So as far as angels are numbered, they are innumerable. But all the angels that have already been created have been created. God's not in the business of making more angels. What do they do? They're waiting on God to give the angels something to do at his bidding. So one of the things that they're interested in down at the bottom of the page is the special interest they have for us in man's salvation. We know that uh, angels appeared um, in Luke's account in the announcement of Jesus' birth. And we know that when Jesus was born, uh, they talked about uh, suddenly there was an angel with a multitude, uh, heavenly host praising God, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth among men whom is well pleased, angels rejoicing and praising God because of the long-awaited time of the Redeemer. Uh, closer to Christmas Day, I'm going to talk about the fullness of time. Do you know that Jesus Christ came to this world when it was absolutely 100% the precise time in history for Jesus to come? Did you know that? It wasn't just an arbitrary day that Mary got pregnant and nine months later uh, there was a baby. It didn't happen like that. The Bible tells us in the fullness of time. What does that mean, fullness? Ready, complete, the perfect time that Jesus was to come. So these angels are there, they're there for a reason. And so uh, they are a company of angels, not a race of angels, not someone Caucasian, not someone dark skin, not someone light skin, not someone yellow skin. Uh, they're not a race of people, but a company of angels because they do not marry and have children. They constitute a company rather than a race. That's right, the center of the page under angels, a company. And they do not procreate. Why can they not procreate? Because they're sexless. They have no male or female organs. They cannot have babies. They're sexless. And so all the angels that have already been created would be created. Well, we also know they take on the form of spirits, that they can manifest them ways them, themselves in different ways. And I have several things listed for you there to think about. So let's look uh, tonight real quickly at lesson five, and I'm going to let you hang on to the lessons you have, and we're going to move on. And fellas, if I could get you to help me one more time, raise your hand. Everybody needs this one. Nobody has this lesson. Okay. Split some there. All right. Very good. Hopefully you're collecting these. And you can use them in the future. Be my goal for you. All right, from the beginning of time to wherever we are in the Bible reading, we know that the scriptures have abundant, abundance of references to the existence of angels. I mentioned to you one of my favorite thoughts is at the tomb where Jesus was laid, knowing that once there were angels there, 
it, it just is something that's in my mind oftentimes more than not. And thinking about what angels did and how they came to minister to Jesus to protect the body, whatever it is that they were to do. So when we ask what do angels do and what are their activities, we would be hard pressed to say right now in the year 2010 specifically what it is that angels do. It would be a challenge to us to answer that, but it would be exciting at the same time thinking about what we could do to um, think about angels. And so as we think about these, let's Let's think about a couple of the examples that we've already studied in here. We're going to replow some ground we've talked about before. But I love this particular instance in 2 Kings chapter 2. You might want to turn there or you can look on the page. Most of it's there. They drive spirit horses. And you say, well, that's an odd way to say that. Well, I really don't know what else to do to say it. That we have the account of Elijah in 2 Kings chapter 2 verses 9 through 12. And the Bible says, and when they had crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, please give me a double portion of your spirit be upon me. So he's asking, he says, all the things that were given to you as a prophet, may God just double portion me with the wisdom and the ability that you have that I would be able to do those things even doubly so. So sometimes I'll turn on the television and, and Keith will go in the other room because she doesn't want to watch it, but sometimes I'll go through the channels and I'll stop and listen to some preachers. And I'll listen to preachers preach, and I'll hear sometimes they raise their hands up in the air, and they'll ask God, everybody that's here today, I pray you'll give them a double portion of your anointing. Wow. Does he really have the authority to do that? No. But here's two prophets, Elisha and Elijah. And Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. And he said, you have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it will not be so. Right there in the middle of the page, verse 11 now. As they were going along and talking, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire of horses and fire, which separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind to heaven. Elisha saw it and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw Elijah no more. And then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. So one prophet's telling another what's going to happen. And I think this is a manifestation here of these chariots of Israel and its horsemen being used by angels of God to do that. I have several other things listed there that you can spend some time studying this week. Well, one thing that's interesting, and we've referred to this again, is what angels do, is they guard the gates. We have talked about this since the uh, Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve were removed from the garden, and we know that there's angels that are there guarding that, or at that time there were. And then we find in Revelation, from the first book of the Bible to the last book of the Bible, we find in chapter 21, angels are said to guard the gates of heaven itself. Now that's pretty interesting to think about, isn't it? That angels are busy guarding the gates of heaven itself. John writes and he says there is a great wall, a high wall, and at the gates there are 12 angels. How many gates are there? 12 gates. So there's an angel at each gate. And the Bible tells us the angels were placed at the entrance of the Garden of Eden so Adam and Eve might not enter it again. Do you think Adam and Eve ever thought about, oh, I want to go home. <laughs> oh, I'd like to go back to the garden. What kind of things, let's just randomly say this. What kind of things did Adam and Eve give up when they were booted out of the garden? Okay, abundance of food. All right, that's a good one. That was one I was thinking of. What's another one? Protection from the weather. Okay, they were taken care of. What else? Oh, they have to die now. Just one second, Ted, right here. 
They walked with God. They could no longer walk with God in the same way. Ted? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right, we're talking about what happened in the garden now. Okay, hang with me. We're talking about the garden. When Adam and Eve were removed from the garden, what kind of things did they give up? They no longer, they didn't have to work for their living. Okay. It was a pleasure taking care of them. Well, they were to till, they were to till the garden. They were to work it. Now they had to cultivate it by the sweat of a brow, and then a woman, would, her pain would be multiplied in childbirth. So things were different. Uh, this is one that just came to me a while ago when I was thinking about this. Now, you're going to say, well, of course, Steve, that's the other. But I want you to think about a world where there's no cancer. Wow. How about having kids that didn't want to kill each other? Yeah, how about that? Having kids that didn't want to kill each other. I hadn't thought of that one. <laughs> yeah. No, no sickness, no illness. I heard Steve right over here. Yes. It was a garden with no sin. And then there was sin. And then I like to say this. It's kind of funny to me, so you can humor me. Eve ate them out of house and home. They, they, got, they got booted out of the garden. <laughs> so uh, things changed. So we know that these um, angels protect that gate. And it must have been frightening for Adam and Eve if they saw that to go back and say, oh, we can't go there. There's angels. They're protecting the gate. We cannot go back in. Well, also in the book of Revelation, these angels are waging war. Uh, we see war between Michael and his angels and Satan and his angels. So whatever that is and how it's described for us, he says, and there was war in heaven. Can you imagine? There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels going forth to war with the dragon. And the dragon warred. And his angels, and they prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast down, the old serpent, that he is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was cast down to the earth, and his angels were cast down with him. It is warring of a different nature than what we're accustomed to. In Ephesians 6, we talked for several weeks here in our seminars about being in a spiritual war. And he says, we're fighting a war that's not fought with flesh and blood, but you and I are fighting a war now that is of a spiritual war. I want to tell you, for all the years that I've been preaching, and my years as youth minister, I think about kids that I've known over the years, that many of them... I'm not but just a few, old, few years older than they are now. And I can think about some of them that have left the church. I can tell you stories about some. In fact, I was sitting at the house the other night and I got a phone call and it was an instant messenger phone call. And so it was somebody that was in my phone book and I recognized the name and I answered it. It was a boy that was in a youth group of mine back in the 80s. And uh, he was reaching out to me because he was having some struggles. And I thought to myself, I'm so glad you called me, first of all. And then second of all, I thought how far, far, far away from God he is. So I think angels are grieved about things like that. I know if the Bible says they rejoice in heaven when someone comes back, perhaps they are grieved. We as humans are grieved when we think about people that fall away. And so we're in this spiritual battle, and it, it concerns us. And so I had a good 30, 35-minute conversation with him on the phone. Uh, I don't know. He may pop in here one day, and, uh, and we'll talk again. But it's a battle, a spiritual battle that's fought in a different realm today. That we're talking about spiritual battles where we're fighting against Satan. And what I say, started to say about this young man is that, to put it bluntly, he has been deceived by the great deceiver. He has been deceived by the great deceiver. 
Satan is out there trying to win those people to him and not letting them be with God and giving all kinds of havoc to them. So when we think about people that you've known, maybe you have someone in your family, maybe you have a son, a daughter, an aunt, an uncle, somebody in your family, and that person is far away from God, I want you to ask yourself this question. Have they been deceived by the great deceiver? Most of the time you're going to say, that's it. They've bought into the things the world is selling us. How many of you know the name of a sociologist named Dr. Tony Campalo? How many of you recognize that name? Okay, there's four of us that know Tony Campalo. Uh, not a member of the church, but he's a socialist. Uh, not a socialist, I'm sorry. Rewind the tape. He's involved in, in social work, and he is a professor of sociology, and he has written several things, and he talks about how the world has changed the price tags. Now, I want you to think about that. The world has changed the price tags. Things that used to be expensive are now discounted to nothing. And things that used to be very little, he's raised the cost up, exuberant. Everything is upside down, tipsy-turvy, to where kids are buying into things, young people, young adults, adults, are buying into things now where God is trying to tell them, keep your morals up, keep your morals up. But Satan says, no, 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 let me deceive you. It doesn't cost anything. Just go ahead and, and fall headlong into that. Is everybody with me? You following what I'm saying? The devil's changing things. He's changing the price tags and people are buying into it. And so we need to be careful about that because this spiritual battle that we're fighting, it's real. It's real. And Satan seems to be winning, doesn't he? He's winning from us. He's taking people away from us. Yes, ma'am. Wow. Exactly. Yeah. She's saying that technology today is, is bringing things into kids' lives that uh, they never would have seen before, and that's so true. Um, I was watching the news just before I came here tonight. I think it was at 5 o'clock, and uh, there was a story about a school district who has these pouches, and they're just um, some kind of a fabric, and it's got a clamp at the top, and when you go into the classroom, the teacher gives you one of those pouches. You put your phone in there. It cannot be opened until after class the kids cannot pry it open they cannot open it and kids were just going nuts they were going nuts they couldn't understand what am I going to do with my, my, my phone I, I, I'm kind of disconnected so the survey went on to say can you tell me your best friends and they rattled them off, rattled them off. you know Tom, Bill, George, Harry okay can you tell me Tom's phone number uh no but you said he's your best friend you don't know your best friend's phone number? My phone number in Coleman, Texas was 625-2493. I left there in 1969. If you ask a teenager to go somewhere today without uh, ways and told them to go to downtown Dallas on a certain street, you think they could find their way? Probably not. Technology's good. Technology has its bad side, doesn't it? has its bad side and so we have to be careful this war that we're in Satan is so brilliant of how he's getting people and so this war is important and we need to be sure that we're on the right side well this is an interesting section now and I want us to spend a lot of time on this so if you will open your Bibles to the book of Daniel the book of Daniel I'll give you a minute to find that but this is where angels are busy ruling nations that the Bible tells us that angels are involved in ruling nations. Their rule is one of stewardship rather than of absolute authority, but yet, nonetheless, they are used. Their ruling is co-regency with God, not one independent of God. In other words, we don't have rogue angels going out uh, ruling on a throne somewhere without God's knowledge. The same thought is presented in the book of Revelation regarding the rule of overcomers with Christ in Revelation 3.21. 
The on, they only do the ruling that God grants to them. And the best example is Daniel chapter 10. Let's follow now. Daniel 10, verses 13 through 21. In fact, I'm going to start at the very first verse of Daniel 10. This is not on your page. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a messenger was revealed to Daniel, who was Belshazzar. And the message was true and one of great conflict, but he understood the message and had an understanding of the vision. In those days I, Daniel, had been mourning for three entire weeks. I did not eat any tasty food, nor did eat uh, meat or wine enter my mouth, nor did I use any uh, ointment at all until the entire three weeks were completed. And on the 24th day of the first month, while I was by the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, there was a certain man dressed in linen, whose waist was girded with the belt of pure gold of Uphaz. His body was like beryl. His face had the appearance of lightning. His eyes were like flaming torches. His arms and feet like the gleam of polished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of tumult. Now I, Daniel, alone with the vision, while the men who were with me did not see the vision, nevertheless, a great dread fell on them, and they ran away to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision. Yet no strength was left in me. In other words, it zapped his strength. For my natural color turned to a deathly pallor, and I retained no strength. But I heard the sound of his words, and as, I, as soon as I heard his sound of his words, I fell into a deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground. So you see, we would say all the color left him, the blood rushed out of his head, he fell on his face, he had his face to the ground, and then let's see what happens. Verse 10. And there behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man of high esteem, understand the words that I am about to tell you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. And he said to me, Do not be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day that you set, heart, set your heart on the understanding this and on humbling yourselves before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. What would be another word for withstanding me? How about opposing he was opposing me for 21 days. And then behold, here's our name, Michael. One of the chief princes came to help me, and I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to give you an understanding of what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision pertains to the days yet future. And when he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face toward the ground and became speechless. Don't you know he did? And behold, one who resembled a human being was touching my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke and said to him who was standing before me, O oh my Lord, as a result of the vision, anguish has come upon me, and I have retained no strength. For how can such a servant of my Lord talk with such as my Lord? As for me, there remains just now no strength in me, nor has any breath been left in me. Then this one with human appearance touched me again and strengthened me. And he said, O oh man of high esteem, do not be afraid. Peace be with you. Take courage and be courageous. Now as soon as he spoke to me, I received strength and said, May my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Then he said, Do you understand why I came to you? But I shall now return to fight against the prince of Persia. So I am going forth, and behold, the prince of Greece is about to come. However, I will tell you what is inscribed in the writing of truth. Yet there is no one who stands firmly with me against these forces except Michael, your prince. So here's a situation where Daniel was involved with angels and used mightily. And the name of Michael was used specifically here talking about the forces that God was going to use through the angel to help Daniel and the situation in history at that time. Powerful, isn't it? You know, from time to time, we will have a, a man that'll go to the pulpit on Sunday and he'll pray. And uh, 
I love it when our men think their prayers out and they're preparing ahead of time and you can tell they've really thought it through and someone will pray and God we know that you are in control of those who sit on thrones you're in control of those who are kings rulers of the world and I love that I don't think I ever want to forget that God places rulers on the throne. You say, well, I don't like the job he's been doing lately. You know what? It's not your job to like it. That sounds pretty tough. But it's God's business. It's God's business. And so God puts leaders in maybe for a time of humbling. Maybe for a time that we don't understand. I don't understand. I don't have all the answers. But I do believe that God puts leaders in control for a reason. If there's Christians praying and we're asking for God to help us, do we think our prayers just go up and hit the ceiling and bounce down? Or do we really think they reach the throne of God? By faith, we believe they go to God, don't we? And so we pray for that and we ask God to help us. There may be a time of humbling. There may be a time of something that we don't understand. Let me ask you this. Let me, let me ask it in a different way. In the Old Testament, did God ever put a person on the throne as a king that wasn't a good king? Oh, yeah, he did. Yeah. You remember those that said, and he did evil just as his fathers did? And then it went on and said, he did even more evil than his father did? So why did God allow that to happen? For a reason. I don't know that I understand all of it, but for a reason, those things took place. And so, we may not understand it here, but maybe we'll understand it in the by and by someday. And maybe that's a question you want to ask. God, why did you allow so-and-so to be on the throne? Why did you allow such and such a king over in Persia? Why did you allow a king in Iran or Iraq, somewhere like that? And you might say, well, when I get to heaven, it really won't matter anymore, will it? You know, you know what preachers want to know? <laughs> preachers want to know who wrote the book of Hebrews because it's not told to us who wrote the book of Hebrews. But I'm thinking when I get to heaven, I won't care anymore. Everybody knows it was Paul anyway, right? <laughs> so we're not going to care one of these days. Well, something else that angels do is they help individuals. Now here's where we're going to have some good discussion tonight. Let's turn to Matthew 18 and verse 10 because I always believe it's important for us to see the passage in the context in which it's written. You know, one of the things our denominational friends do not like about us is they say that we pull a scripture from the text and use it as a proof text without using it in the context of the verse. In other words, the what's before and what's after it and plus what's in the middle. So let's be careful of that and let's don't use proof text all the time but set it in the context. So let's look at Matthew 18 and let's begin at about verse 7. Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks for it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come but woe to the man through whom the stumbling block comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than having two hands or two feet to be cast into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into the fiery hell. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that their angels in heaven continually behold the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which is lost. Now, I dare say the majority of us probably have not read this passage about saying that we have guardian angels in the context of all the verses that we've just read. And most of us pull that verse out and say, See to it that no one despise one of these little ones, for I say to you, their angels in heaven continually behold the face of the Father who is heaven. We don't think about this before. I was listening to a preacher once and he was talking about verse eight where it talks about you should cut off your hand or your foot if it causes you to stumble and then if your eye causes you to stumble. And this preacher went on to say, you know, if every man plucked his eye out every time he lusted after a woman, we'd have a lot of blind men walking around. 
So is that what he's saying literally? To pluck your eye out? Is he saying literally cut your foot off? Your hand off? No, he's not saying that. These are words of Jesus. I don't know about you, but my Bible, this is in red. These are words of Jesus. In fact, he, he begins there in verse 3. And he called a child to himself and set him before them and said, so Jesus is speaking there all the way down to verse 21. And so we have to be careful about proof texting things. And so what is it about guardian angels? The very first night of our class, I brought this up and we shared some stories, some examples of things that we think about angels being somewhat of a guardian angel. Uh, so, what do you think? Do you have a guardian angel? You'd like to think so. Tell me, as well as I know you, I hope you have a guardian angel too. No, I'm only kidding. Everybody loves Tell me, sir. You've had, You've had one. Okay, he says he's had someone looking over him. All right. So, let me play devil's advocate for a minute, okay? What about all the good Christian people who have had something bad happen to them? Where was their angel? Was he asleep on the job? So why didn't the angel protect him? Because people still have free will. You mean if I walk out in the street in front of a truck tonight, it's not going to do well for me? Probably not. That's right. Sometimes there's things in life we don't understand, but I think it's difficult. Uh, Bill, do you want to say something before I go on? Yes, sir, I saw your hand. Go ahead. Suffering is part of a Christian, okay? That's true, there is. Yeah. Suffering is the case of salvation came to a cross. Yes. Yeah, wasn't, wasn't comfortable there. Yes, sir, Ted. Okay. So if I jump out of a plane and my parachute doesn't open, I'm going to ask my guardian angel, why didn't he take care of my chute? <laughs> yeah. You, you see what I'm saying? There's a lot of things we don't understand, and a lot of things are crazy like that. And by crazy, I mean uh, uh, bizarre things that have happened. And so we don't know all the answers. But let me just say this, and I am not going to argue with you. I don't want anybody to go out here tonight and say, oh, our preacher, he's so narrow-minded, he doesn't think there's guardian angels. Let me just tell you, is our faith to the point to where we have to put everything in one basket about a guardian angel? Is that faith? Okay. Look, I was talking to somebody before service tonight. My sister, on her birthday, was diagnosed with kidney failure. The next year, she was told, you have to go on dialysis. A year later on her birthday, she said, you have to have a kidney transplant or you're going to die. Where was her garden angel? Bad things happen to good people, okay? But let me reverse that and tell you, I know a lot of old ornery people that good things happen to them and I don't understand it. Does that make sense? Why do the wicked prosper and the righteous seem to just fall apart? Why? Because that's life, isn't it? Somebody right here. Uh, Joyce, it was Joyce. Yes, Job was tested. We're tested as Christians, yes. Yeah, yeah. You know, you can take a businessman who's a good Christian man. He goes into business and something happens and things just spiral out of control. He loses his business. He loses his 
house, he loses his car, the IRS comes after him, and he's sitting there going, woe is me, God, why, why? And then somebody out here that's doing dirty, under-the-table business shenanigans, and it seems like they're prospering. Can you explain that to me? The rain falls on the just and the unjust. There's a lot of things in this life I don't understand. Why does somebody go to the hospital and get well and somebody goes to the hospital and dies? I don't know. If our faith is all about a guardian angel, I think our faith ought to be a little better than that. Does that make sense? Let's don't put all of our eggs in one basket about guardian angels. And if you leave here tonight and you say, I got a guardian angel, uh, then good on you, okay? Good on you. I, I, I hope that's the case. Uh, yes, sir. We do. There, say that last part. Satan has his angels as well. Yes, ma'am. And, and, and who's going to win the battle? Let me tell you who's going to win the battle. The angel you listen to. Or the voice that you listen to. That's the one that's going to win. If you've got evil whispering in this ear, and you've got good whispering in this ear, let me tell you, the battle is who you're going to listen to. And it's far better to have a group of people that are there to support you, to encourage you, and to lift you up in your walk, and to say, hey, don't go down that road. Come with me. Let me help you. But if you listen to the voice that says, oh, come on, we'll throw in together. We'll go over and rob, and we'll go and steal, and we'll do these things. It'll be all right. That's exactly a passage from Proverbs. It's exactly what Solomon is saying. If you listen to those that entice you and pull you into evil, you will reap what you've sown. And so we have to be careful. It's the voice that we're going to listen to is the voice we're going to follow. So let's make it Jesus. Oh, how extreme were you? <laughs> Uh -huh. Okay, that's a tough choice right there. <laughs> Especially if it's spring and uh, no, uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, sometimes it's the littlest things about what we're going to choose, how we're going to do, what, what what decision are we going to make. Boys and girls make that decision on dates. Husbands at work that have wandering eyes, they make that decision. Wives make that decision. But you know, for Christians, it's not a hard choice, is it? Just do the right thing, right? Just do the right thing. And I pray God will help us with that. And um, we didn't even get to our lesson tonight. Would you not lose this between now and next time maybe? And we'll get on the one. And so let's pray and I'll let you go tonight. Father, we do thank you for these so very interesting creations of yours called angels. Help us to, to study Help us to be open-minded. Help us to continue to study. And to thank you, Father, for the way that you have used your messengers in the past. And, uh, Father, help us to see your will in our life. and Help us to be faithful every day. And pardon us of our wrongs now, in Jesus we pray. Amen.